This is Inside Forensic Science, a podcast series from the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee, where we dissect the evidence from a historic case. The case under review in this second series is that of Madeleine Smith, who was accused of murdering her lover, Pierre-Emile Langelier, in 1857 by poisoning him with arsenic. If you haven't heard them already, it's worth going back and listening from the start of the series because there's a lot of evidence to get your head round. And in this final episode, you're going to need to decide whether you would have found Madeline guilty or innocent or not proven. Because here in Scotland, where the case took place, there are three possibilities in front of you. Lots more on that to come. Let's do a quick recap. Madeleine Smith was a middle-class Glasgow socialite who had an illicit affair with Pierre-Emile Longelier, a Jersey-born clerk with little money or social status, but considerable ambition to move up in the world. As we've heard throughout the series, the affair was documented in great detail by Madeleine's many letters to Emile, which were passionate, full of longing and pretty explicit. Beloved, if we did wrong last night, it was in the excitement of her love. Yes, beloved, I did truly love you with my soul. I was happy. And it was a pleasure to be with you. The affair calls when Madeline becomes engaged to another man. But when she tries to get all her saucy letters back, Longelier refuses and Madeline goes into a panic. For God's sake, do not bring your once loved Mimi to an open shame. It would break my mother's heart. Oh, Emile, be not harsh to me. So she warms things up a bit and writes to him, suggesting they meet one Saturday night in March. Here's what was said in her declaration. The last note I wrote to him was on the Friday before his death, Friday the 20th of March current. In consequence of that note, I expected him to visit me on Saturday night, the 21st current, at my bedroom window, in the same way as formerly mentioned, but he did not come and sent no notice. There was no tapping at my window on said Saturday night or on the following night being Sunday. I went to bed on Sunday night about 11 o'clock and remained in bed till the usual time of getting up next morning, being eight or nine o'clock. Madeline is adamant she hadn't seen Langelier and there was no one to give evidence to the contrary. Pop that in your pocket, because it's important. On the following Monday morning, Langelier dies from arsenic poisoning. As we heard in the last episode, Madeline had bought arsenic on several occasions. She claimed to use as a cosmetic. So, we have a possible motive in the form of Madeline's reputation and future marriage being at stake. And we have the means in the form of her buying arsenic. But we don't have any concrete evidence of opportunity. I realise that was kind of a Reader's Digest version of events, but hopefully that's got you up to speed. Let's pick up from where we left off in episode five, because there's one more thing I want you to mull over before we retire to consider the verdict. Pierre-Emile Langelier died from arsenic poisoning, and as we heard from our pathologist, Dr Richard Shepherd, the quantities of arsenic found in Langelier's body were significant. 82 and 7 tenths grains, which is, you know, I, I, we don't work in grains anymore, but I calculate that to be about 5.5 grams of arsenic found in his stomach. 5.5 grams. I mean, you know, that's, that's a good teaspoon Full. I'm struck actually by the size of the dose. Something really quite concentrated has got in through his mouth and into his stomach. And as you say, he's been purging, he's been vomiting, so this probably doesn't represent the totality. And we also know there's more in his small bowel and his large bowel and distributed around his body. So this is, this is massive overdose. Dr Frederick Penny. How much arsenic would destroy life? It is not easy to give a precise answer to that question. Cases are on record in which life was destroyed by two and four grains. Four or six grains are generally regarded as sufficient to destroy life. 
and the amount I determined as existed in the stomach was 82 grains. Could Madeline Smith, Emil's lover, accused of poisoning him, really have hidden that volume of arsenic in a cup of cocoa, as the prosecution claimed? Dr Douglas McLagan. In order to make boiling water a sufficient solvent of arsenic, you must continue the boiling of the arsenic for a considerable time. If you want to dissolve a pretty large quantity of arsenic, you require to boil it violently for half an hour. Does the evidence point to murder? Or is there another explanation for Langelier's death? To kill someone, you have to give them about two or three hundred milligrams of arsenic. He's been given five and a half thousand milligrams of arsenic. This is a massive quantity. How do you get that much into someone, even in cocoa or chocolates or, or, or whatever? And, and if, if I was pushed down and I had to make a decision, I would say that points to me rather more towards suicide a deliberate ingestion of this amount than managing to slip it into food that you're giving someone. But, but, uh, how fortuitous it was for Madeline that he died when he did, and maybe that is a crucial finding too. But, don't you just love all those buts? During the trial, the defence made a case for Pierre-Emile Langelier having a history of suicidal ideation. Auguste Vauvert de Mien. I'm Chancellor to the French Consul at Glasgow. I was acquainted with Longelier for about three years. I know Miss Smith and was acquainted with her family. Longelier stated to me that he had once been jilted by an English lady, a rich person, and he said that on account of that deception, he was almost mad for a fortnight. He was easily excited. When he had had any cause of grief, he was affected very much. I thought that he might be led to take some harsh steps in regard to Miss Smith. By harsh, I mean rash. This was after Langelier had given me his full confidence as to what he would do in the event of Miss Smith's father not consenting to the marriage with his daughter. Beloved Emile, I have just received your note. Emile, you shall yet be happy. You deserve it. You are young, you who ought to desire life wishing to end it. Oh, for the sake of your once beloved Mimi, desire to live and succeed in this life. And Thomas Fleming Kennedy, cashier at Huggins in Cole, Glasgow. He came to me one morning in February and said, with tears in his eyes, that he had received a letter demanding back all the correspondence. I advised him strongly to give back the letters, but he would not. That would be about a fortnight before 23rd of February. He said that she wrote that a coolness had arisen and asking back her letters. He said he would never allow her to marry another man as long as he lived. I said it was very foolish. He said he knew it was, that it was an infatuation. He said, Tom, she'll be the death of me. That was about the last conversation I had with him. I'm Robert Baker. I'm a grocer at St Helens, Jersey. I lived in Edinburgh at one time and acted as waiter in the Rainbow Tavern. When there, I was acquainted with Langelier he was very easily excited. He was at times subject to low spirits. I've often seen him crying at night. Latterly, before he went to Dundee, he told me he was tired of his existence and wished himself out of the world. I remember on one occasion he got out of bed, went to the window and threw it up. I rose out of bed and went to him and he said that if I had not disturbed him, he would have thrown himself out. Dear Emil, explain this sentence in your note. Before long I shall rid you and all the world of my presence. God forbid that you ever do. My last letter was not filled with rash promises. No, these promises written in my last letter shall be kept. Not a moment passes but I think of you. Before long, I shall rid you and all the world of my presence. Did he mean it? Or was he just trying to push Madeline's buttons? It's safe to say the question of suicide has really divided our experts. For toxicologist Lorna Nisbet, the size of dose may well be indicative of suicide. 
unfortunately, when you're looking at cases of suicide, which is where we actually do take stomach contents for the large part, that's where most of those um, cases come from, is that people want to make sure that they do it right, if that makes sense. So they will take far greater than is needed to get to have the effect that they want. Um, so that's why when you look at stomach contents, and unfortunately if somebody has opted to take their own life, that you will find a lot of substance in the stomach. So it is something to consider, definitely, in this case. Brace yourself, there's another but coming. This time in the shape of Dr Christensen when he's examined for the prosecution, who suggests that suicide or murder will both likely involve excessive doses. I know very well that what is found in the stomach in undoubted cases of poisoning by others has been considerably larger than what was necessary to occasion death. Because the very fact of poison being found in the stomach at all, in the case of arsenic, shows that more has been administered than is necessary, as it is not what is found in the stomach that causes death, but what disappears from the stomach. Our defence lawyer Donald Finlay Casey doesn't believe L'Angelier's death was suicide. Well, there's easier ways of doing it. Why would you slowly kill yourself and die in agony? Why, why would you inflict on yourself such a long and lingering death? Uh, su suicide's a very odd thing. Uh, suicide is... The genuine suicides just get on with it. They just go and do it. They have reached a point where they can take no more of life. They don't run around telling everybody they're going to do it. It's very... It, 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 it's a black loneliness that only the suicide or the near suicide uh, can feel and understand. Suicides, I say, don't, don't leave messages and sit and wait and being rescued. That, these are cries for help. This was no cry for help. This was a man who inflicted upon himself a long and lingering death. I don't buy that because he wasn't that kind of a man. He was a fairly cowardly individual. I guess I'm supposed to kind of sit on the fence here, but what occurred to me is that 82 and 7 tenths grains sounds like a lot of arsenic. But maybe it's only a lot if you're a toxicologist. I've been thinking about this, and if, if I was trying to poison someone using arsenic and I knew nothing about the necessary quantities, which I don't, what would I do? Well, I'd probably add about a teaspoon's worth and give it a stir, just as if I were adding sugar. Dr Richard Shepherd tends to agree. It is only a teaspoonful, you know, and a, a teaspoon in a cup of cocoa or co chocolate is perfectly practical. It, remember, it is, it is tasteless. So we're not talking about something that you have to try and disguise a taste. On the other hand, a teaspoon of white powder containing soot in my, in my chocolate, maybe I'd notice the soot floating on the surface or the fact it was blue chocolate. I, I don't know. It, it, it's, um, it, it is, I think, a significant feature of this case. Gives you food for thought, though, doesn't it? Assuming you've still got an appetite after all this. So was it suicide or murder? What do you think? Well, there is no explanation um, there are possibilities. If it was a suicide, then it was the last throw of the dice, and he got it wrong. Far from taking too much, he didn't take enough. If it was a poisoning, the attempts so far had singularly failed because he was still alive and wouldn't go away. He would neither give her back the letters, nor would he just disappear. Uh, and she didn't give him enough. And he lingered on for rather longer. On the other hand, she gave him more than enough, because he's buried in the Ramshorn Kirkyard in Ingram Street in Glasgow, so it worked. She got rid of him. There is no answer, because we don't know what happened. But arsenic killed him, of that there is no doubt.
On the 7th of July, 1857, James Moncrief, the Lord Advocate for Scotland, rose and delivered his presentation for the prosecution. Then it was the turn of John Ingalls, the Dean of Faculty, who was defending Madeline. He stood and addressed the jury with a now legendary opening statement. Gentlemen of the jury, the charge against the prisoner is murder, and the punishment of murder is death. And that simple statement is sufficient to suggest to us the awful solemnity of the occasion which brings you and me face to face. So how would Donald Finlay KC, who we heard there reading from Ingalls and one of Scotland's top defence lawyers, have approached the case? What would his line of defence have been? Oh, very, very difficult to know. Um, you, you rely on what you are told by the person you are defending. And we don't know what Madeleine Smith ever told John Ingalls, of course. So we, we don't know exactly what his instructions were. We know what she said in her uh, declaration, but we don't know what she said in the privacy of consultation. Uh, but trials have a, major trials have a life. They, they, they develop, they, they, they ebb and flow. So some people plan them out. I, I, I don't. We make a start and we see where we go. So you, you go with it and you might see a line that develops so you'll pursue that. You might see a line opening up and you would abandon that straight away. But the defence position in this case was pretty simple. The Crown could not put Emile and Madeleine Smith together close enough to say, well, that's when she did it. On the other hand, there was not the slightest doubt that a considerable amount of arsenic killed Emil. So there's only two choices then. If not Madeleine, then somebody else. And that somebody else was either some complete stranger or it was, as was hinted at very strongly, suicide. Now that was quite a risky defence to run. And of course much use was made of on the one side, uh, uh, this villainous creature seducing this fair maiden and all the rest of it. Uh, and on the other, uh, a fairly strong hint from the Crown that Madeline was no better than she should be, as my old granny used to say. Uh, so very interesting to see how it developed. Uh, and, and looking back on it, of course, uh, rewriting history and hindsight and all the rest of it, reverse engineering, are very, very easy. It's so difficult at the time when you're actually asking the questions. You said you'd love to defend the case. If you were prosecuting it, what would be your strongest line, do you think? Uh, I think I would have stripped away uh, all this phony morality and simply presented her as uh, a a woman of easier virtue than she should have been who got caught up who was ensnared all right by a love rat, uh, who only wanted her for her money. Uh, she wanted more than that, and the impediment to that was uh, Emil, uh, and she needed rid of him, and rid of him she was. As simple as that. As simple as that, indeed. If your brain is now well and truly pickled, and I know mine is, Congratulations. I suspect we're feeling exactly like the jury probably felt back in 1857. We haven't had space and scope to go through every detail of this case here in the podcast. We've been cherry picking our way through the forensic evidence in particular. But you can go and read all the trial notes for yourself and it would be great to hear if you've come up with some other scientific detail you think is particularly salient. We've put a link to the trial in the episode notes if you want to go and do your own deep dive. Having heard the case for the prosecution and defence, the Lord Justice Clark formally addressed the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, the contest of evidence and of argument is now closed and the time has now come for deliberation and decision. 
and to enable you to discharge that duty right and justly, it is necessary that you remember that the case is to be tried and decided solely on the evidence. You are not to give the slightest weight to the personal opinion of the guilt of the prisoner, which I regret my learned friend, the Lord Advocate, allowed himself to express. Nor are you, on the other hand, to be weighed in the prisoner's favour by the more moving and earnest declaration made by her counsel of his own conviction of her innocence. I think on both sides such expressions of opinion by the counsel ought never to be brought before a jury. Neither of them are so good judges of the truth as all of you are. At five past one in the afternoon on the 9th of July, 1857, amid the whispers of a packed court audience, the jury withdrew. There were three possible verdicts available to them. Guilty, which would lead to the death sentence. Not guilty and not proven. So why are there three possible verdicts in Scotland? Lady Dorian, Lord Justice Clark. That came about um, during the reign of Charles II in the latter part of his reign, where juries were unwilling to convict uh, people charged under certain unpopular statutes, usually to do with the monarch's religious policy. And they would uh, acquit uh, for crimes such as field preaching and uh, things which were not supposed to take place. So a rule was introduced at the instigation of the Lord Advocate of the day that uh, juries, instead of returning the general verdict, which previously had been in fairly simple terms, either guilty, sometimes referred to as convicted or culpable, or on the other hand, not guilty, sometimes recorded as clean it or innocent, instead of doing that, they had to return a, a special verdict stating only whether the facts were proven or not proven and it was then for the judge to decide whether the accused should be found guilty or not guilty of the um, offence. So that's the point at which the not proven seems to come into the equation. Sometime later in the late 1720s, um, juries decided they didn't like this and started resorting to uh, verdicts of not guilty. But the consequence of that was that not proven remained uh, left over somehow and became one of three verdicts uh, that uh, were available and remain to this day. In systems which have lay juries, they tend to be 12. Uh, in England, people talked about 12 good men and true. In America, there's Henry Fonda, the 12 angry men. So 12 is the number associated with the jury. For some reason in Scotland, we've always gone for 15, the bigger jury. The problem with that is uh, that if you follow the English model or the American model, to convict, uh, you need all 12. That's not easy to get everybody agreeing. Uh, in England, if you can't agree after a certain period of time, then you can bring in a guilty verdict by 10 votes to 2. So that's still it's a high bar for the Crown to, to achieve. In a Scottish jury of 15, the Crown need 8. That's it. 8 voting for guilty, 7 voting for not guilty, off you go to the rope, my boy. That gets you hanged. Now, on one view, you might say, if you have eight for guilty and seven for not guilty, what is that if it's not reasonable doubt out of 15 people? Because on a different day, it might be the other way around. And that, of course, is a different conversation for a different time. It's a fundamental problem with the jury. A jury's verdict doesn't mean you're guilty or anything else. It's simply the opinion of the majority of 15 people. But that is why, because of the size of the jury, we have had three verdicts, one being guilty, 
Now, all that means is uh, the jurors think the case has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. If you believe in a God, then guilt is a matter for him and nobody else. If you don't, it's just a word. Not guilty and not proven were there to enable people to reflect what they thought of the prosecution case. If they thought the prosecution had simply failed to prove its case, they would say the case was not proved. That was not proven. Uh, and given that the prosecution has to prove its case, if it doesn't, that is the verdict you bring in. On the other hand, it was recognised and has been recognised that some people on the jury might want to go further and say, no, 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 we're not, I'm not just saying this, this case has not been proved. I'm telling you, this person is not guilty. So it, 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 it's a more positive affirmation uh, of the jurors or the jury's view uh, of the individual who has been tried. I think there's often a misconception by the public that a verdict of not proven means the accused can be tried again, whereas uh, that isn't the case generally with a, a not uh, guilty verdict. But that's entirely wrong. That's not the case. Uh, and one of the reasons for uh, concern about the verdict over the years has been the fact that it uh, isn't defined anywhere and there is no way in which an accurate definition can be given to the jury of what it means. There are numerous attempts by people to say what they think it means. Sometimes uh, it's suggested that it means that the jury uh, were not satisfied with the evidence of guilt, but nor were they satisfied that the uh, accused was innocent. That's how Lord Coburn put it. Uh, you might say that on the one hand, they could say we're not satisfied that the accused committed the crime, i.e. not proven. Or they could say we are satisfied that he did not commit the crime, i.e. not guilty. But that's only speculation as to what uh, that uh, verdict might mean. William Roughhead described it as not guilty, but don't do it again. Um, the, the, the real issue is that juries are told that there are two verdicts of acquittal, not guilty and not proven, but nobody can explain to them what the difference between the two is. At 1.32, less than 30 minutes after retiring, the jury returned, and the Lord Justice Clark called for silence. The jury found Madeleine not guilty on the first charge of attempting to poison L'Angelier. Not proven on the second charge of attempting to poison him. And not proven on the third charge of murder by poisoning him. The vote had been 13 to 2 on all three verdicts, with the two dissenters finding her guilty on all three counts. The courtroom erupted. Given the evidence that was um, presented in the case and the way the case unfolded, do you think a not proven verdict is, is to be expected or was to be expected? Uh, in that case, yes, I do. I think so. On the, on the, on the, uh, when you take all the factors into account, when you factor in um, that the, the gaps in the Crown case were the critical gaps. You know, there were the gaps about um, opportunity for administering the um, poison. Uh, there was no way of knowing there was a large amount of uh, arsenic had been administered, but there was no way of knowing when or whether it had all been administered at one go. Um, I think now, it, that um, evidence could be available, or at least it could be shown that the concentration was such that it must have been administered over a period of time. But there was no way of knowing anything like that um, at the time. And when you factor in um, the novelty of a, a young female, r respectable 
a girl from a good family in the West End uh, and you factor that in with the death penalty if she's convicted and an, no chance of an appeal and everything else, I, I, I think it's not surprising that the verdict was not proven. The verdict was obviously not proven. Mm -hmm. How was that received by wider society? How was it viewed? Differently. Um, and again, if you look at the newspaper accounts, like the kind of respectable working class newspaper at the time, trade union paper, The Sentinel, uh, said that, you know, if she had been Maggie Smith of the, of the Wines, the verdict would have been guilty. Eleanor Gordon, author and affiliate professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. There kind of is a view that it was really to do with the fact that she was middle class and they wouldn't, you know, condemn a young woman like that. But actually, I think it was more to do with the fact that the, the, there was a missing link in the chain of evidence against her and the judge was quite clear in directing them to more or less to find it not proven. There was those, and you can only go by what the newspapers are saying, and, and actually there, there are other there are other accounts of people abroad, like Bernard Shaw saying something or other. There were those that thought she got away with it because of her class. And if it was because of her class, I think it was because they could afford the best legal representation possible, rather than being outright biased, because the judge was not kind to her when he was summing up, not to Langelier either, but not to Madeleine. I mean, there wasn't a great deal of sympathy for her coming from that direction. Others felt, you know, she, again, it was to preserve this myth of Victorian res respectability. They dis described Longelli as a wolf in sheep's clothing who had seduced one of their own. You know, he was a bad apple that had come in, but uh, we'd shown that, you know, he couldn't upset the stability of bourgeois Victorian you know, society. So there were those that were very sympathetic to her. There were those that felt she'd got away with it uh, because of her class and because of her gender. Uh, so it, there, was a, there, was quite a, there was quite a mix. And other newspapers, was it the Times felt that uh, chastised those that were sympathetic towards us as just being sentimental, you know, because she was young, beautiful. And middle class, I mean, she wasn't that beautiful, but, you know. So they thought it was ridiculous that people should be sympathetic you know, to her. So it was actually quite uh, a wide range of views. It wasn't all one one or the other. Have you been in cases that have had it not proven? Yes. Right. Do you ever take that as a personal comment on the science and how it's been delivered? No, not at all. Uh, absolutely not. Director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee, Professor Neve McDade. Our job as scientists are to, as forensic scientists, are to be servants to the court. Um, so we present our evidence to the best of our ability in a way that is as clearly communicated as we can um, so that the triers of fact, the jury, can can use that evidence to help them come to a verdict. As a forensic scientist, I, I have it might this might sound strange, but I have no interest in the verdict. It's not a matter for me. Um, I'm not the person having to 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 um, make that verdict. So it it isn't of importance to me what the verdict is because I'm impartial and I work for the courts. That's a pity because I'm about to crowbar you into the position of the jury in this case and um, <laughs> ask you if you think they made the right call, me. Oh, gosh, that's, I knew you were going to ask me this question. Um, am I surprised that it was not proven in this case, given trying to project my mind back to, to what it would have been like in the day? So the, the experts that gave evidence were some of the heavy hitters of the day. You had the expert toxicologists, um, but also the forensic pathologists. And, and they, they, were, they would have given their evidence, I think, in a way that would have been impactful and would have been impressive. And why or whether or not that evidence swayed the, the jury is clearly not obvious because the verdict is not proven. 
And so I, I, I really don't know why or how one can get into the mind of the jury, if you like, back in those days to try to work out what those discussions were. What was the conversation around the table in the in the jury room when they were trying to determine what the verdict of this was? It's very difficult to try to see what it might have been. And so it, that's my answer, which I'm hedging my bets and not giving you um, uh, my verdict. Well, I'm not letting you get whatsoever. away with that entirely. <laughs> um, did anything jump out, though, in, in reading through all this? Did anything jump out as being a possible source of... of doubt or lacking clarity or, um, you know, when you were reading this as a scientist, did you sit and think, mm. um, I think it's, it's, it's difficult really because, because you're, you're looking, you, you, you try to see what are the two different types of hypotheses you might come up with here. So one is on the prosecution side, which at its ultimate, the offence level of, of hypothesis is, well, Madeline Smith caused the death of this individual, so therefore she murdered him. So that's at the highest level. Versus the defence hypothesis, which may be, actually he decided that if he, if, if he couldn't have Madeline, he couldn't go on and therefore he was going to take his own life. If you look at those at the sort of the two opposing sort of offence level propositions, as we would call them. And then you have to look into the layers of that and deconstruct it from the science perspective. What evidence is there and how does it support each of those propositions? And the medical evidence in particular really is, is effectively neutral because what it says is he died of arsenic poisoning. So that becomes in the eyes of the jury something that doesn't really add value in determining those two. Did she kill him or, 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 or did he die by his own hand? It doesn't help you in evaluating that question. So that takes out the pathologists from, from the, the court case, if you like. So then it comes down to the toxicology. And then that becomes how much poison was used becomes, I think, important. We know that Emil was ill after a number of visits that he, or, or, or time that he and Madeline spent together. Um, so was that, on the one hand, Madeline trying to get the dosage right? Could it be perceived in that way? Or was it, on the other hand, Emil being overcome with emotion because he knew he was losing her? So could it be looked upon in that way? And again, there's perhaps arguments for both sides of that particular, um, those particular suggestions. What the scientific evidence tells us is he died by arsenic. And it doesn't really pushes further than that. So effectively, the science in this case becomes not, it, it, it doesn't point strongly towards one of those possible things that occurred than the other, I would say. Uh, and so it comes down to a lot of the circumstantial evidence, or sorry, the eyewitness testimony evidence as well, which in the courtroom may have been very persuasive. We just don't know. And the jury may be trying to balance up these scientific evidence that they've heard versus the eyewitness testimony that they heard and, of course, the letters and so on and so forth. So so it's, it's really difficult to say how they would have reached that judgment, but the judgment that they reached was not proven. What about you? Would you have returned a not proven verdict or a different one? Do you think Madeline did it? I couldn't resist asking the same question to all our experts who've helped us out across the series. I wouldn't even like to hazard... I guess. You're sitting on the fence along with Neve. I can see the two of you perched there. It's <laughs> going to be a substantial fence, I suspect. <laughs> oh, the scientists never give me a guilty or not guilty. Come on, do you think she did it? I would refer you to the previous answer I gave Penny. I... <laughs> I, I would... I would like to think, given her circumstances, that she didn't, and that Emil was just a jilted lover that committed suicide. Um, if I were to commit suicide, I'm not sure that arsenic would necessarily be my uh, poison of choice. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? It's a very interesting question. <laughs> that you're not going to be drawn on. <laughs> I don't think I don't think it's possible at this remove, you know. Even looking at um, the a lot of the evidence, uh, 
it's really it's really very difficult uh, to reach a, a, a firm conclusion, um, which perhaps suggests that not proven was the uh, was the right verdict. I really I really don't know. Actually, I've started to look at it, and I really don't know. Um, I yeah, there's we seem to be questioning her all the time but we don't hear from her so we can't hear any of her excuses for any of the evidence that's been put to her um, which makes it really really difficult um, a part of me thinks that maybe she did but then also a part of me goes well maybe it was suicide and he wanted a way out so you know maybe he got too many boils in his neck I don't know I really don't know but it would be interesting do you think she did it? probably <laughs> I, I, I took a vow a long time ago as a pathologist nev never to form a view because I'm so often, I'm so often wrong. I, I, I simply don't know. Um, I, and I think um, it, it is very difficult to prove uh, on the pathology and on the toxicology. You know, the background is certainly different. But um, I simply couldn't say, I'm, I, this is where I retreat and say, I'm a scientist, I'll give you the scientific and pathological findings, but I don't make the decisions, and I'm very pleased that I don't have to. A very diplomatic Dr Richard Shepherd, ending this episode and this series of Inside Forensic Science, The Case of Madeline Smith. Our other experts were Professor Nevenick Dade, Professor Eleanor Gordon, Dr Lorna Nisbet, Richard Morris, Lady Dorian and Donald Finlay KC. A huge thanks to all of them for their time, energy and enthusiasm. A big thanks to all of our actors. Joe Riley, Phil Latin, Craig Swan, Ian Boffey, John Harding, Andrew Thompson, Lindsay Moyes, Alan Richardson, David Bryce, Erica Holland, Oliver Wilkinson, Russell Mullen, Alice Jenner, David Stewart, Ian McDermott, Dan Holland and Mark Stephen. Madeline Smith was played by Kira Lucchesi. The series story consultants were Heather Duran and Clara Morris, and the series was written and presented by me, Penny Stewart. The audio mix was by Steve Bull. Inside Forensic Science, the case of Madeline Smith was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee, and is funded by the Leverhulme Trust. I was trying very hard to get Neve McDade to pin her colours to the wall mm -hmm. and tell me whether she thought she did it. And she point blank refused, but I'm going to put the same question <laughs> to you, Donald. Do you think she did? Well, she said she did. Uh, when she was interviewed um, and allegedly said, in effect, uh, yes, I'd done it, and given half a chance, I'd do it again. Uh, and then, of course, there was the, the curious story, which came down to me, um, from a friend who was also a judge in this generation. His father was a judge as well. Uh, and he became friendly with uh, the family, or the descendants of one of the lawyers who had been involved in the trial. And after the case was all over, uh, they had been dining together one night. Uh, those who had been involved in the trial, the judge and others and so on. Uh, and it was a, a country house somewhere. And there was a knock at the door, uh, and the butler, or whoever, said there was a gentleman who wanted to see them. And he brought this chap in, and he was a merchant seaman who had been away at sea and had come back to discover the whole story of Madeline Smith. And he told them that on the night in question, he had been going from A to B, and he saw Madeline and Emile together and he plugged the gap in the Crown case. So they did what they could do, and that was they uh, clubbed together all the coin they had in their various pockets, they gave it to this chap, told him to go away, keep his mouth shut and never speak to him about it ever again. An after dinner story, or the truth, I don't know. I think she got away with murder.